Several years ago, I heard a story about a guy named Larry Walters. He's 33 years old. He was tired of just sitting around and seeing his neighborhood from the perspective from which he'd always seen it. So he went to the local army surplus store and bought 45 weather balloons. And uh, that afternoon, he got back, got a tank of helium, strapped himself into a lawn chair, <laughs> and hooked the balloons to the lawn chair. Now, he thought, thought he'd go up about 100 feet and get to see the neighborhood and, and you know, he had a good plan, kind of. Actually, he went to 11,000 feet. <laughs> he had with him, now, he had peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a BB gun <laughs> and a six-pack a six of Diet Coke. <laughs> so he was ready for the trip, but he didn't know where he was headed. And now he's 11,000 feet, and Los Angeles shut down the flights for two hours because he was in the flight path at 11,000 feet. He was afraid to shoot one of the balloons now with a BB gun. That's why he took it, so he could maintain where he was going to land. He was afraid to when they finally got him down. Police asked him, what are you doing? <laughs> News media was all there, too. I said, were you scared? He says, absolutely. <laughs> Would you do it again? No. Well, well why, why did you do it in the first place? He said, you can't just go on living your life the same every day and just sit there and not do anything. He had to rethink his choices, though, didn't he? When it comes to God's intervention in our lives, when, when we approach what it is that our life is going to be about, we need to see from a different view sometimes what has become mundane to us. Christmas, again, yep, every year. For a lot of us, that's been a lot of years. Comes, it's going to come again next year. If we're still breathing, we'll still go through the same process, won't we? We'll still hang the decorations and put up the tree and, and go to the parade and do whatever else we do. Luke 2, verse 11 says, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You'll find that you will recognize him by this sign. He'll be a baby lying in a manger, snugly wrapped in strips of cloth. Suddenly the angels, the angels join. We sang angels this morning. We sang about the angels this morning. The armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. God is pleased with what's happening here. There's a song by Michael Card years ago that I remember uh, called uh, has a, it, it's, I forgot the name of it but it has a line in it that I've never forgotten. It says, eternity stepped into time so we could understand. That, that line has always struck with me. What did he mean, eternity stepped into time? Well, you've heard me teach that God's not bound by time. Time's not what God is about. We're about time, but God is not. But this is one of those great foundational doctrines of truth, doctrines of our faith. You see, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He is the embodiment and the revelation of eternity, and He stepped into time and came into that small town of Bethlehem, just a baby in a manger. And we don't seem to think about all the ramifications of the baby in a manger. We like to see the nativity and the baby in a manger, and then we don't think about all that it means. If there's ever a good time to think about this, it's now, Christmas season. Because of the profound and startling implications of the truth of the fact that Jesus has always been. Jesus did not start in Bethlehem. Always been. The doctrine is called the incarnation. But we're actually celebrating only now, we're celebrating at Christmas time, the birth from a human womb. He was always God. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist. He pre-existed the carnation. He was before time ever began. He existed before anything was. He existed before he was born into human form. Think about that. You ever see one of those booklets that tell you about the year you were born? You ever see one of those? Well, I just, pull, I just went to the internet and pulled one out. And I pulled out 1956. 
Anybody born in 1956? Raise your hand. Okay, this, there are a few of you here. Here's some of the things that happened that year. The first transatlantic telephone cable between the Americas and Europe was completed. The cable ran 2,250 miles. The average cost of a new house was $11,700. Monthly rent was 88 bucks. Yearly wages, 4,450. Cost of a gallon of gas, 22 cents. New car, $2,050. Elvis had four of the top 10 songs that year. Memories are made of this was number one, Dean Martin. But he had Heartbreak Hotel, Don't Be Cruel, Hound Dog, and Love Me Tender all in the same year. Most popular television show, I Love Lucy. The other two were Ed Sullivan Show and Gunsmoke. So it, it's interesting to go through that and to read those and go back to the year you were born and say, oh, I didn't remember that. Of course you didn't. You were just born. You see, we, we, it's interesting to see that because we didn't exist before we were born, before we were conceived. Jesus not only existed before he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he existed before his earthly mother was born. It gets confusing when you try to put all this together. He was her creator, and yet she birthed him. We don't, we don't go into this when we think about this, but, but I, I want, I'm making a point here. In a real sense, Jesus doesn't have a birthday like we do, yet he does have a human birthday. In his essence as God, he had no beginning. He always was, and he always will be. Even at this time of Christmas, this speaks of great truth. Micah 5.2 said this, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are small among the clans of Judah, but out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We marvel at the scripture, the prophecy of Micah predicted where Jesus would be born hundreds of years before the birth because God had revealed it to him. He predicted the genealogy of his birth, promised the king of kings would be from the line of David. You can read it in, in Micah. But Micah also says about this ruler who was the anticipated one from Israel, that his origins are from ancient times. The Hebrew actually says, days of immeasurable moments. You can't measure where Jesus was. You can't measure how long he's been in existence. Jesus always was. He existed before time, before earth. Uh, there is a scripture that talks about what was on Jesus' mind before he was born. I've mentioned it a couple of times before. In Hebrews 10, verse 5, 6, and 7, I want to read it to you. This is a declaration from Jesus as he was preparing himself to come into a woman's womb in the earth and be born here. It says, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, the Father, you do not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in Scripture. Our Lord didn't begin at Bethlehem. He had no beginning. He came to be one of us, to save us. He knew his purpose from the beginning. That baby was to be born from the womb of a woman to have the authority of a man born in the earth. You see, the reason that the authority Jesus gave to us has validity. I mean, you remember that Jesus said, authority has been given to me and I give you this authority. And authority always trumps power over all the power of the enemy. And you shall do what I've done and greater shall you do. What gave him the authority to give us his authority? Well, being born of a woman. Because Satan was cast onto this earth. He was cast out of heaven in a way of punishment, no longer in heaven, and he ruled this earth. But when Jesus, so, so Satan really has no authority in this earth. He wasn't from here. He's not born here. Uh, there's a citizenship problem between Satan and Jesus. Jesus was a citizen of the earth. One of us. Satan is not. He is a foreign alien. He does not have any rights here 
no privileges here. He was not born here. But when Jesus came from Mary's womb, conceived by the hand of God, the Holy Spirit, He was born here. His power and authority was in this earth. That's why He came. That's why He gave us power. He transferred power to us, knowing that we too were born into a sinful world. Yes, we are sinners. He was not. However, that same authority, by being born again, came into us so that now we are like Him, being formed in His image, and we have the power that He had. That's why Christmas is important. Christmas is important not just because this was God becoming man, but because He came as He did, He gave us power to do what He has done. You know, when your children are growing up, you want to help them. You want to help them know who to marry, what school to go to, what occupation to grab hold of. But they don't fill your expectations usually, do they? When is it that they get that mind of their own, you know? I mean, just like they love us, they care about us, they want to be obedient, but then they finally go, no, I'm going to do this. A lot of times they struggle to find purpose in life. Sometimes our kids live with us till it's far too much. Our daughter came back from college. We love our daughter. But then she found a boy. And it took him seven years to get married. He was in college a lot of that time. Then he was working. We kept saying, aren't y'all going to get married, please? Because they were at our house the whole time. I mean, it's seven years of the Waltons, kind of. But she married a fine man who loves God. We thank God for that. They serve the Lord. He's a good father and a good husband. Purpose is tough, though, for some people. Jesus knew his purpose. He came to fulfill a purpose. He came to do His Father's will. He knew that it would mean a bloody death on a cross. He knew that He would give His life. I listened recently again to, yesterday in fact, I listened to it again, Amy Grant's song called Welcome to Our World. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I've just got the last little stanza that I want to read to you. As much as words can say of the writer of this tries to explain how desperately we needed Christ to come. We needed Jesus to come to us. The law was a heavy burden. We needed to be freed. We needed grace. We needed deliverance. We needed freedom. We needed victory. We needed authority and power. Here's what this says. Fragile finger sent to heal us. Tender brow prepared for thorn. Tiny heart whose blood will save us. Unto us is born. Unto us is born. So wrap our injured flesh around you. Breathe our air and walk our sod. Rob our sin and make us holy. Perfect Son of God. Welcome to our world. That's why He came. To take our sin. To feel our flesh. To know our pain. To understand what we don't understand. To give us hope. And to give us a right to do what He said we can do. He came to earth for a purpose, which was to do the will of God. That's the ultimate meaning of this angelic proclamation in Luke 2. For unto you is born this day a Savior, one who knows what you're going through. But he came to die. Nothing else can explain his birth. Had he been born and died like many of us will, just in your sleep at night? No, he took upon himself all that we should have taken. And he freed us from it. So I want to make a slight detour from this uh, explanation of doctrine. Uh, you know, a lot of people think a, a sermon about doctrine is, is boring and, you know, just... But it, it, but it is practical. And maybe you don't think it's as practical if I preach on forgiveness or salvation or something. But listen to me. I, we'll get there. I mean, consider this, the cement slab under your house is boring too, but aren't you glad you got one? It's your foundation. It holds everything up. 
Not as exciting as the kitchen cabinets and the beautiful curtains and the decoration, but you wouldn't have any of that if you didn't have the foundation. So sometimes we need a doctrine sermon. We need a foundation. The Gospel of John, there's no account at all of the birth of Jesus. John decided to overlook that part of it and just go back to foundational truths. He was pouring the slab. That's what John was doing. Makes the birth of Jesus seem even more amazing than it does on the surface. A baby born to a virgin is amazing within itself. But who this baby was and is and the preexistence of this child and the, the creator of his own mother is still more amazing. John 1, 1, 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Far back as we can remember, as we can think, to the beginning of time as we know it. Jesus, the Word, was already there. How do we know the Word referred uh, to Jesus in John 1? 14 says, the Word became flesh, wrapped flesh around this Son of God, made His dwelling among us. He became one of us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Very clear, John's referring to Jesus. No other one could be the one he's talking. He's the same one Micah prophesied that we read earlier. As far back as the beginning of time, the word had already been decided that it was, he was Jesus, the living word, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory. I want you to see this. Now, Father, he's praying to the Father, glorify me with your presence. We sing about surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We hope for that. We long for that. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He is telling us of himself. He was in the presence of God, the Father, before this world ever began. He was in the heavenly glory that we long for when we search for revival, when we look for manifestation, when we want to see God come to earth and show himself to us. So did Jesus come to be in Bethlehem? Did he become the Son of God? Or was he always the Son of God? Clear, isn't it? Before the world began, in eternity past, Jesus existed. And he gave it all up for 33 years of human life. Bible's clear. He was in glory we can't even imagine. Heavenly glory that, I mean, heaven is filled with that glory. We get a touch of it, just a, just a bite now and then. We feel it and we're in awe and we're on our face before God. Our, our salvation is based in that glory. Our healing is based in that glory. Our worship experience is based in that glory. Yet we have not yet arrived to experience what Jesus knew. In Exodus 33, Moses talks about it. On Mount Sinai, after the people of Israel committed idolatry, he saw the glory of God. And as he was coming down from the mountain, his face was aglow, shining, and he didn't know it. But it was impossible without the presence of God. In fact, Moses understood that leading the people on the journey, had, he had to have the presence of God. He said in Exodus 33, 15, if your presence doesn't go with us, if your presence does not come with us, don't take us from here. We, we don't want to go anywhere. We want to stay here. In Exodus 34, 29, it came about when Moses was coming down from the mountain. That's where it talks about all the sons of Israel beheld the glory of God on his face. It seems to me that the goal of our worship is seeing God in His glory. Is that really what we want? You know, having God is better than having what God gives. A lot of folks are always after what God can gift me with. Especially at Christmas season, we have this mentality that, uh, what are you going to give me? And you know before we had any grandkids by the time our kids had grown up and there was that gap in there some of you experienced that there were no grandkids there were no babies and so a bunch of us adults are sitting around the Christmas tree exchanging checks and gift cards <laughs> and I said one day I said what this is crazy yeah I love you but then I checked to see did you give me as much as I give you huh <laughs> there's an aggravation there if you overgive, you know <laughs> be careful <laughs> like, 
Oh, that's all you gave me, huh? Okay. I'll remember that next year. <laughs> Having God is better than the gifts He gives. Always. Not about how we feel. No. Not about what we like or don't like. It's not about you. It's about Him. And that's what worship is. Worship is a personal thing. It's personal between you and God. Moses' face shone because he'd been in the presence of God. I want my face to shine. And, and I want the countenance to be that of God in His presence. So many Christians never behold Him. They, they never get close to that. They never understand that. They don't really worship Him. They've not, they have they've no daily connection between um, God and their daily life. The daily life. The daily life is what worship is all about. Can you worship Him when you're cooking? Yeah. When you're on your job? Absolutely. People come to church and they turn on the spiritual they go to church for the wrong reasons. They go to get something rather than to give anything. Come in with the spirit of the world on us. Minds on, on other things, not God. Critical spirit will eliminate worship from you. Did you know that? I said that. I confessed that the other day. I think on a Thursday night, I said, when we moved, we left our pastorate in Texas and we went to Nashville and we went to a church and I'd sit there for a you know, uh, the times I was there, I was traveling a lot, but Carol and the kids were there and I'd sit there and when the preacher was preaching, I'd go, well, I would have said this and this and this. Well, if I would have been up there, I would have done it. You see where I am? God, God spanked me. He said, shut up and listen. You might learn something. <laughs> Remove your critical spirit and start listening and absorbing. I'm trying to tell you something. I will teach you through this. If you'll just zip your lip Cleanse your spirit and your mind and listen. I've got some things to tell you. This man is a man of God. And I said, yes, sir, Lord. And I started receiving. See, a devilish spirit will find all kinds of things wrong. While a worshipful spirit will find things to thank God for. Say, God, I want to be in the presence in the present. Hello? In your presence in the present. I don't want to wait for it. I don't want to be sometime in history and I don't want to remember the past only. I want to be there today. You know how it is. Music was too noisy. It was too loud today. I didn't like the way the preacher preached. Why not come back again? Pastor's wife didn't even shake my hand. Because it's all about me. I'm always on my mind. <laughs> the worldly realm will put that on you. If you want to go to the church of mammon, lifeless, dead, complaining, murmuring, ineffective, ruled by the world system, you've come to the wrong place today. That's not who we are. It's not what we're about. We're not going to be that. And you're in the wrong church. Jesus came to earth as a baby. God became one of us in a manger. Think about that. Because God wants an encounter with you on a daily basis. Not just once a week or twice a year. He wants to turn your rejection of Him because of misunderstandings and bad theology or whatever experiences that you've had. He wants to turn it into acceptance and love and peace and joy. He wants to have a continual encounter with every one of us. Jesus came to earth to make us tabernacles of His glory. So we pray, God, fill us with Your glory today. That's why Jesus came as a baby. One of us. To know us. And so we could know Him. So we could hold Him. A baby. Anything more precious than a baby. Nothing. Nothing in life. Why do we worship? Because that's the only thing that brings God from heaven to earth. Nothing else will do it. There are no other, no other demands placed on God other than worship that will bring Him into a place like this. God's searching for worshipers. Do you know that? This very moment, He's looking for you, worshiper. Jesus came to save us so we could have a piece of heaven here on earth. You've heard us say it over and over again. Lord, invade earth with heaven right here today. 3950 Green Mountain Drive, in case your GPS is not working, Lord. It's us. Our worship is for Him. It's his favorite part of what we do. 
It's not about the preaching. We don't need another sermon. I know I do it every Sunday, but that's not the most important part. What, what God wants us to know is that it's time for us to encircle the throne. Give our praise to Him. Why Christmas? Why not? Revelation 5.11 Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne. Living creatures and elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise Him this morning. Let's worship Him this morning. We worship You, Lord.
I just don't think we have any idea of what heaven's going to be like. Maybe just a taste of it here and there. Can I ask you to bow your heads for a moment? Maybe you really want to worship. You know, you're worshiping something. Maybe it's not God. Maybe it's your job or a relationship or finances or something else. Sports, it could be something on television. It could be some illicit sin that you worship because that's where you spend your time and energy and mind. God wants you to give yourself to Him today. I want to take just this moment. I'm going to ask you with heads bowed and eyes closed so that you can do this before the Lord only and, and me. I just I want to know because I want to pray for you. You'd say, I've been worshiping the wrong things, Pastor. I've been worshiping life itself. I've been worshiping idols and didn't realize it, but now I do and I need to worship Jesus with my life. You slip your hand up and say, I want to change my worship pattern and I want to begin worshiping Jesus with my life every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn my attention toward Him. Father, I pray now for these who've lifted their hands today. Lord, that, that as we make this concerted effort to turn our eyes from the world and to turn our eyes on Jesus, you would help us by your Holy Spirit's power. Release us from that pressure of life that pushes itself in on us and let us think of you in all those moments where we've just kind of let life weigh us down and bombard us. We thank you, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord. How many want to be, at this Christmas season, filled with the Holy Spirit, with, the, with an evidence of God working in your life? and? Maybe speaking in a heavenly language and just say, God, I want more of you. I want all you've got, Lord. Lord, I pray you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit power now. We want all you have. We want, we want everything you've positioned us for. Fill us up, Lord, right now. Say, I receive everything God promised me. I take it in now as my very own in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Now cultivate that. Keep the weeds out of your life. You planted a seed in that prayer. You said, God, I want all you've got. I want to be everything you've positioned and assigned me to be. Now, keep the weeds out of your life and go back to God and take care of this seed that you planted this morning with that prayer. Lord, I want every. Don't forget that prayer. I want everything you've got for me. I want to become all that you positioned me to be. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God's a good God. Amen. Amen. He sent Jesus to us, a baby in a manger to become one of us. Wow, what a thing to know. And then he gave us his power. Amen. Said, You're mine. You're my children. Go and do what I've done and do it greater. That's what he said. Amen. Let's do that today. Hallelujah.